Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to talk about a few words that God gave us Christians that strangely we, uh, well, we rarely quote a phrase that we rarely use, an actual commandment Christians largely ignore. I know this video won't be very popular. Uh, the government did a study on uh, how lizards walk on a treadmill, uh, $1.5 million spent on that. Uh, do a video on how to walk in the spirit and you might get you know a few hundred views. Verse 16 of chapter 5 in Galatians, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So the question is, is how do we walk in the Spirit? How do we do that? And who is the command actually given to? Uh, we know that Scripture interprets Scripture, and we also know that we can't talk about this without talking about responsibility. We're studying the uh, epistle uh, to the Galatians verse by verse, and in the uh, our last study, we were somewhere around verse 16 of chapter 5. The great treatise on grace versus law, and since the day that Christ was here, humanism or synergism or legalism, whatever you care to call it, has been the great enemy of the gospel of grace. Why? We either live by grace or we live by the energy and the work of the flesh. The Galatian believers had come to Christ and uh, they were now being, I guess what I'd, what I'd say, bamboozled by those who said that the work of the Lord Jesus Christ was great. But in order to be redeemed, you also needed to be circumcised. And uh, down through the, the years, uh, some human work has always been added to redemption. As I pointed out in many a video, you are not redeemed because of anything you did. You are redeemed because Jesus Christ paid the price. He died in your place and he made you righteous. And there is nothing, nothing to be added to that. You know, it's amazing how much the word grace is just bandied about you know, in modern Christian circles and and so very little understood. Oh, that we might rejoice in the grace of God. In our last study, we had reached the uh, 16th verse of chapter 5. We've been called to liberty. We're not to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love we're to serve one another. For all of the law has already been fulfilled in one word, Thou shalt love thy neighbor or the one near you as yourself. And that's what Christ did. He came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And so it's already been fulfilled. That is a perfect passive in the Greek in verse 14. It's already been fulfilled. And that is clearly evident in the death of Jesus Christ in our place. He loves us with an everlasting love. We come then to the 16th verse, and in no way do I expect to settle it in, in your minds. That's really something between you and the Lord as you study His Word. Some translations there have the word Spirit capitalized, and and some do not. Probably most of you have Bibles that have the word Spirit capitalized. I believe the reason for that is to emphasize the fact that Christian scholars uh, all down through the years have always reached the conclusion 
that this is the Holy Spirit. So therefore they capitalize the word, the word spirit. There are, however, and have always been, a group of scholars who say that, well, when the Holy Spirit uh, uh, means the Holy Spirit, it's always articulated. And when it isn't articulated, it means the new man. It means, you know, you walking in your spirit. And they uh, try to make a, a differentiation between your spirit and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to uh, spend a whole lot of time on the spiritual man. I believe the, the spiritual man is the new creation in Christ Jesus. Uh, much of what, uh, what uh, shall I say, uh, evangelical Christianity believes that there are spiritual Christians and there's carnal Christians. And, and out of that have, have come these uh, movements uh, like the Keswick movement, the lordship of, of Christ movement, uh, lordship salvation, uh, the victorious life movement and uh, deeper life uh, you know, movement and so on and so forth. And you either come down and you accept Christ as your savior or you come down and you rededicate and you submit your life so that, you know, you can be sanctified. And they've always tried to divide the body of Christ into two groups, two categories and such, which you can't do. Folks, if you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you're holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. I've said that a thousand times. It's true. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Were we? Yes, we were. And you cannot be any more righteous than that. You are complete in Christ. The new man is renewed and is created. The, the new man itself was itself was created in righteousness and true holiness. There are not carnal new men and spiritual new men. You can't do that with the body of Christ. You are living under grace, not law, and yet Christians by the droves evaluate other Christians by the lives that they live. You are under grace not under law. Now in Philippians, we are told that He has given us of His Holy Spirit, and I suggest to you that it's a bit, a bit difficult to separate the spirit of the new man from the Holy Spirit. Now I'm not going to, to spend a lot of time on this. The typical model is that Adam was made body, soul, and spirit. And when Adam sinned willfully, you know, Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned willfully, then he lost the spirit part. And, uh, and so then he was now a body and soul. And so much of scholarly Christianity, if I can use that term, has felt that the unregenerate man is a two-part creature and the, regen the regenerate man is a tripart. The unregenerate man has a body and a soul. The regenerate man has a body, soul, and spirit. And whether that model is biblical or not, I'm going to leave that up to you to decide. There are various uh, different opinions on this. We know that biblically we have a new man. And we know, biblically, we have an old man. Christianity calls it an old nature and a new nature. I, I don't like to do that. As I pointed out uh, in past videos, when you talk about nature, I think of the two natures of Christ. He was, he was absolutely God, a very God, and he was, he was man of very man, the God-man Jesus Christ. 
uh, deity as well as humanity and one of the great studies of fundamental solid conservative Christianity is the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ coupled with his humanity the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ God's Word speaks of us as a new creation and an old creation which is spoken of as the old man and the new man the new man is absolutely righteous he's as spiritual as he can possibly be he doesn't get any better by your works he doesn't you know slowly become sanctified because of your submission your service and your dedication and your surrender and your whatever whatever you know what all you know all of those things folks have come out of man's ideas as we descend further and further and further into human works the truth is we are made perfect in Jesus Christ I'm gonna allow the word to be capitalized for the moment because I think it's really difficult to d differentiate between your new creation and its intimate connection with the Holy Spirit. However, I, I do not want to leave you folks with the impression that the new creation, the new man, is the Holy Spirit. And for that reason, some have suggested the uh, words here should not be capitalized, you know, unless they are articulated. But back to verse 16. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now we have in the Greek, the, the grammar, we've got the dative here. We have the locative dative, walk in the sphere of the spirit. There's two kinds of datives. There's the dative of means. I don't think it's a dative of means. Normally the dative of means is coupled with a verb in the passive voice and the verb here is in the active voice. In fact, it is a present imperative. It is a command. We are commanded to continue to walk in the Spirit. Now, you know, how do we do that? Well, a lot of translators have taken it as a dative of means, but the verb is not passive. For example, just look ahead to verse 18 in your Bible. If, if, if you are led of the Spirit, well, now there the, the word is passive. It's a passive voice. I believe this is a dative of means, but I believe the dative in verse 16 is locative. I believe it's walking in the sphere of the Spirit, which is, drum roll, the Word of God. Big surprise. If we walk in the Spirit, and the Spirit speak to us, speaks to us through the Word of God, you will absolutely not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The word not there is our word who may in the Greek. It's our double negative in the Greek. This I say then, and, and this is a present imperative, continue to walk in the sphere of the Spirit. It's a command, and I believe God's Holy Spirit speaks to us primarily through His Word you will absolutely not, absolutely not in any way fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It is very difficult to pay serious and deep attention to the scriptures and dwell on the lusts of the flesh. You know, just go ahead, try it. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say it's impossible. That's why I believe that it, that it is locative in verse 16. It's walk in the sphere of the Spirit. Now if we go over to Romans chapter 6 verse 14 we read that sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under law and that's going to become very very evident in just in just a few moments in our study here in Galatians. 
But take a look at Romans chapter 8, verse 14, the 14th verse in, in uh, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Folks, if you're not led by the Spirit of God, you're not a son of God. That's what the text says. If you're not led by the Spirit of God, you're not redeemed. And somehow, yet somehow, I am supposed to preach to you folks that you ought to let yourself be led by the Spirit of God. you got to be kidding me. You ought to come to some kind of surrender so that the Spirit can lead you. Folks, if the Spirit isn't leading you, you're not a son of God. And I didn't say that. I didn't say that. God did. If we go over uh, to verse 18 of our present chapter, chapter 5, it's a first-class condition. You know, I always get accused of building uh, doctrine on conditional clauses. I, I, don't wanna, I don't mean to do that. I don't want to build doctrine on conditional clauses. I don't want to build doctrine on, on uh, prepositions. I just want to rejoice in the inferences. It is a first-class condition. Since you're led, or if you're led by the Spirit, and you are, so since you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're not led of the Spirit, you're not Christ's. Why should we take these verses and suddenly build on them a, th a theology that, that's not biblical? You know, folks, it would be so easy. Now, I'd probably get ten times the views, at least. It'd be so easy to take the rest of the hour here and point out how that I'm led of the Spirit and you're not. Well, I'm led of the Spirit. And you, boy, you ought to be. And, you know, and if you people would just be as surrendered as I am, as dedicated as I am, and, oh, and as holy as I am, you know, then you'd be led of the Spirit. You know, that, that'd be an easy thing to preach. But, folks, God says that you're under grace and you are led of the Spirit of God. Did you know that? Now, why is the word walk there? The word is peripateo in the Greek. I'm going to suggest that it's there because I think God is guarding your walk. He says He is. He says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Now, what we can do with that verse is say, well, oh, I, well, I believe that verse. I'm just not good. Pastor, I'm not good. That, that's a great verse. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, but the problem is, Steve, that applies to you. That applies to others, but it don't apply to me. But I'm not good. Folks, if you're not good, you're not wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight. And if that's true, then Christ didn't die in your place. So you can't, can't wiggle off that hook, okay? I think that he uses walk because walk was a very common thing. You know, when you... When you, when you walked around, you did a lot of things. You, you could do a lot of things uh, cognitively, you know, you think, uh, live, you know, you know. If he had used the word live by using some other word, you know, I don't know, you know, but, it, but he used walk. People walked a lot. And you, you just did it. And, and I think that that word is used because we feel like that we have to feel God's presence and I think the word walk is used because we may not feel it. But folks, He's with us. Always. There's never a moment that He's not with you. We have been given a walk. God has ordered our walk and given it to us as a gift. A gift. Imagine that your walk is a gift from God. A gift from God. Now, you can argue that, well, you don't have enough money, you're not handsome enough, you know, you're not pretty enough, you're not, you're not uh, healthy enough, you're not popular enough, but I believe God has given you the walk that you have as a gift. A gift by grace, 
and, and certainly wrapped up in love. My feeling is that the word walk is used in the sense of our normal activities. You know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, every one of you is in full-time Christian service. You may not think you are. I, I'm absolutely convinced you are. You are in the service of Christ in whatever job or whatever daily activity that, that you've been given by God as a gift. Every bit as much as when, you know, if you were teaching a, a Bible class. I think the word walk is used here as our normal activity, our normal day-to-day -day activity inside the walk that God has built around us in the spiritual realm. And in that case, we will absolutely not, double negative, fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, is that the new man that won't fulfill the works of the flesh? It's a good question. Am I supposed to think that the new man can fulfill the lust of the flesh? Well, the verse says, Behold, I'm saying to you, continue to walk in the Spirit or by the Spirit, whichever way you, you want to do it. The trouble is, if I make it by the Spirit, I infer that sometimes I'm not led by the Spirit. But God says that if I'm not led by the Spirit of God, I'm not a son of God. And I know that I'm His child. And I cannot know that from the way I live and the things that I do and the high, just the highly holy spiritual life that I live. No, 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 no. I know it, folks, because He said so. He said so. We walk by faith, not by feelings. I will never forget sitting around in a circle Bible study class and the teacher said, well, you know, how do you, he, he went around asking everyone, how do you know that you're saved? You know, I know there were at least a, a dozen people in that, in that uh, circle. And they went around and you should have heard that the reasons that they had, you know, and I thought, well, gosh, I, I don't, uh, I don't have any reasons like that. And they got around to me and, and well, how do you know that you're saved? And, and I said, well, God said so, because God said so. And they didn't like that. I guess I was supposed to feel it or something. I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I was supposed to do, but it, but it wasn't good enough to that uh, Bible teacher for me to, to just say, well, I, I know I'm redeemed because God said so. You know, I thought that that was a great answer, pretty good answer. You know, I still think it is. I still think it's a, a good answer 36 years later. You know, I've, I've pointed this out. You know, how do we know there was an ark? You know, well, we have to find a rotten piece of wood to prove it. No, it's just God said there was an ark. Somebody, folks, is not going to fulfill the desires of the flesh in this passage. It's going to go on and tell me that the flesh has desires against the spirit and the spirit has desires against the flesh and these are absolutely contrary one to the other. Okay? And we'll, we'll try to... I'm going to try my best to get this all put together here for us, you know, before the Lord comes back. But we've got to spend some time thinking about this text, folks. The 17th verse is telling me that there is no cooperation between flesh and spirit. These are absolutely contrary the one to the other. Of people that I talk to, it seems to me that the great effort is to combine the two, you know, to get the flesh to do something spiritual, to get it to do something good. I believe verse 17 is telling you very clearly that there is absolutely no cooperation between the flesh and the spirit. That everything the spirit des desires is correct and everything that the flesh desires is incorrect and that the flesh never ever desires anything that's spiritual. Ever. Ever. 
it's a very clear demarcation here. The model in verse 16 could be that there's, well, there's two entities. There's, there's the old man and there's the new man. You know, or there's both an old and a new man, and then there's the you, the mysterious third person, you, you know, who possesses both an old and a new man. But folks, somebody here walks in the sphere of the Spirit. Somebody's doing that. Now listen to me. The old man, however, never walks in the sphere of the Spirit, and he never does anything acceptable to God. Verse 16 is saying that if somebody walks in the Spirit, somebody else won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. How could, let me ask you, how could the new creation do anything but, but walk in the sphere of the Spirit? How could the old creation ever walk in the sphere of the Spirit? How could the new creation ever fulfill the lusts of the flesh? And how could the old creation ever, ever be acceptable to God? Because in the flesh dwells no good thing. And yet I'm told here that somebody, somebody is being told as a present imperative, that's, that's a command to walk in the spiritual realm or to walk by means of the Spirit. How do we do that? How do we do that? I have trouble with the dative of means simply because I'm told that if I'm not led of the Spirit, then I'm not Christ's and I don't, and I don't belong to Him and I, and I know that I am. Somebody is, here is commanded to walk in the spiritual realm. Who, who is that? Who's the command get, be given to here? And, and that somebody who is commanded to walk in the spiritual realm is told that he will absolutely not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, folks, I'm not trying to overcomplicate this. I, I, I'm really not. But it's amazing how this equation works out. Is the new man told that he won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh? And how could he do that? Well, one solution to that problem is to suggest that there's not a new man and an old man. There's just only you. Poor you, you know, there's just you, a single natured individual, and you have a new creation, a new man that never sins. You have an old man who never does anything but sin, and these are obviously in conflict one with the other. Just read Romans chapter 7, oh wretched man I am. And you, you, here we are, here we are sitting on top of this awful conflict. And so the actual you is either working under the new man or under the old man. And, and that appears to be the model that most Christians use to, to get out of any difficulty in verse 16. And uh, that is okay with me if that's your model. That there is a you, that, that you have an old man and a new man that can, that can control the you. And if the new man controls the you, then, well, you're, you're walking in the spiritual realm. If the old man controls the you, well, you're fulfilling the loss of the flesh. But I'm going to tell you, folks, that doesn't make a lick of sense to me. I like, like something that, that is, we, we choose which nature to entertain. You know, that, that kind of that brings... In, in my opinion, a blasphemous idea of choice here. Uh, that does bring in a, a, the matter of choice. Yet we have a command there to walk in the Spirit. Romans 7 says we don't have a choice. And, and folks, you guys have to decide what model you want to take here. Uh, I'm going to suggest something here. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's right or wrong. I, it's up to you to decide, but many people use the expression that, that there's a you, and if you want to, if you want to take the, and I've heard this a thousand times, if you want to take the old man for a ride, hey, you can do that. You know, if you want to take the new man for a ride, if you want to be involved in the activities of the new man, well, you can do that. That choice that you never had before, but, you know, 
before you were a Christian, you didn't have that choice, but you became a new creation in Christ, and now you have that choice. And my answer to that, folks, is horse hockey. It contradicts the whole idea of Romans 7 conflict. L let me ask you, how do you really know that you're a new creation in Christ? How do you know that? Second question, those of you who would say that you really know that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, do you want to sin? Do you want to sin? Now, it's a real problem for me to say, well, well, we can t you can take the old man for a ride if you want to. I don't want to. It's difficult for me to believe that, that, that any, any of you who is serious in your walk with the Lord, who is really serious about your relationship with Christ, would say, oh, yeah, I really want to. I, I want to. Yeah, I want to do that. I want to. I, I really want to disobey. I really want to do that. I'm not asking you whether you do it or not. I'm, I'm asking, do you want to? That's what I'm asking you. I think any one of you who is a new creation in Christ Jesus wants to walk with the Lord. And I don't think that you want to sin. I guess what I'm leading up to here is that I think verse 16 is just like verse 14 of, of Romans chapter 8, 8, 14, Romans 8, 14, that you're led of the Spirit. Uh, you are led of the Spirit. You are walking in the spiritual realm, and you will not, you will not. I take this as a promise. I don't take this as, as, as uh, some command given to a Christian who has to live a certain way of life uh, so that he'll be sanctified. I take this as a commitment from God that you will absolutely will not, it's strong language, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Okay, the new man can't do that. All he does is righteousness. All the old man does is sin. Dearly beloved, I think God fulfills what he commands in the sinless new man. And in my opinion, this answers the questions. It answers the questions, how do we walk in the Spirit? Who is the command given to? Interpreted in, in light of the whole, uh, you know, the analogy of Scripture, we see our responsibility. We, we actually see where our real responsibility lies. It's not in the flesh. As far as the who goes, it can only be me. As far as the how goes, I, folks, I have to separate us from that entirely. We're the, vine, we're the branches. He's the vine. We're not the vine. We don't produce. God does. Forget about the flesh lusting against the Spirit and everything else. You know what the subject is here. If we walk in the spiritual realm, we are led of the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 14 will absolutely not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And now we look at this, at this lusting, the flesh, which I believe to be the old man lust, who's lusting against the Spirit, which I believe to be, you know, the new man. That's why one questions whether it should be capitalized, the word Spirit should be capitalized or not. I mean, you know, and we can argue about that. I don't see how you can separate the two. We can argue that verse 17 is saying our flesh is lusting against the Holy Spirit. That's what your Bibles are saying. If they capitalized it, they're, they're saying that your old man lusts against the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't have a big problem with that, as, as some do. I think it's difficult to, to really differentiate between the leading of the Holy Spirit and the new creation in Christ. So I admit that that's a close tie, but I believe verse 17 is saying that you have a spiritual man and a carnal man, an old man, and they lust against each other. 
this, uh, this flesh lusts against the spirit, and it says the spirit lusts against the flesh. It's the, it's the word, the word lust is the word desires. The desires of the flesh are not the desires of the spirit. And your Bible has it, most of you probably, if you know, your, your Bible has it capitalized. So it says, you and your old man are lusting against God, the Holy Spirit. And that may be. I have no problem with you making the word spirit in verse 17, your new creation in Christ. Though, I, if you want to put a little s instead of the big s on, on the word spirit, but, but look at it. We have them lusting against each other. And if I walk in the spiritual realm, verse 16, I'm not going to fulfill, to fulfill the desires of the flesh. So those desires are there. Look at verse 18. But, but since you're led by the Spirit. Now this has got to be dative of means. It is a, a passive verb. Since you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the desires of the flesh, isn't what it says. You're not under law. You're not under law. Why in the world is it law there? You know, it hasn't been law for a while. We were uh, before looking at law versus grace. This, the epistle here is God's great treatment or treatise on the, the issue of law versus grace. But now all of a sudden we have the desires of the spirit and the desires of the flesh and these works of the flesh are soon going to be enumerated, none of which are any good. Why did we change the law in verse 18? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 there would have to be law in order for there to be condemnation. And you're not under law, you're under grace. Under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? No, no. We can't possibly submit ourselves to that from, from which we've been freed. That's Romans 6 and in Romans 7. Dearly beloved, either God has done a great work and you are walking in grace, or you're going to use this passage of Scripture, as, as many do, to put yourself and others, most likely, back under the same problem we had as we began our study in Galatians. That's why it changed from uh, desires of the flesh. I was told in verse 16, I, wouldn't, I would not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Suddenly in verse 18, I'm told that if I'm led of the Spirit, I'm not under law. And if I'm not under law, the works of the flesh have no foothold. I think law is mentioned here because all the works of the flesh are condemned by law and you're not under law. Here's where the, I think the rubber meets the road. All right. Why is God giving us any commands at all since we're not under law? Think about that. Well, if he didn't, how would we know what God's will was for our lives? How would we know? The Bible is, a, is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It's primarily a revelation of the person and work of, of Christ. The, the command cannot be to the new man or the old man because of the Romans 7 conflict. It has to be to us that the command is given. Does God have a right to command us to do something that he knows that we have no ability on our own to do? Well, I, yeah, I'd say absolutely he does. Absolutely. We're accountable regardless. 
And it is the grace of God that fulfills what God otherwise commands. The very commands given us, I believe, are a lovely portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, when you look at those imperatives, those commands, do you see that as a lovely picture of Christ? I do. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who filters out all of the ignorance, but opens our hearts to the truth. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Folks, rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.